So, Stuart, welcome to uh, Time Team Tea Time. We've just um, had a look at St Mary's City, which was quite something. I, I think when I talked to uh, Derek and Lawrence about it, Derek said it was of its time. <laughs> and I think he might have been being polite a bit, uh, technically, and one or two other things about it. But I think it had a charm about it. I was quite pleased to see it again in many ways. And um, it, 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 it raised a lot of really interesting questions. But um, I wondered your central role, which Derek, uh, who's at Bournemouth University, is an academic there, he, he was very impressed by your persistence of, <laughs> of, of going for what you believe was there. And what quite a few people want to know is, how, did they subsequently found, find a fort, any fort? Has more fort work been done? Well, the catching up I've been able to do, I haven't seen anything published which says they found any more of the first forts that we were looking for. But there were four forts at, at St Mary's. And we knew that when we were there, uh, and one of the confusions in the story was you couldn't tell the story of every fort that was there, and we had to focus on one fort, although in all possibility that the, the forts may have overlapped over time. And subsequent work I know that's gone on there, they've actually found one of those forts which was missing when we went there. Uh, and strangely enough, um, I, I found this rather rather funny, actually. Uh, it was a civil war fort because the civil war was, wasn't only fought in, in England. It was fought in the colonies as well. You had, you had royalists and Puritans in the colonies and they fought each other just like they did in, you know, in, in England. And, and they built a fort at St Mary's during the civil war. And it was called Pope's Fort after the governor there. And it was actually around the mansion that we found. Do you remember we found the brick the, foot in the mansion? The, I it's think it was St. Peter's mansion, was it, or something? That's right, yes. It, it was actually around, around the, the, the building. In fact, uh, left the building in the centre. I'm just looking at my dates here. 1634, the Ark and the Dove arrive. That's right. Um, there was an early chapel, 1639. The chapel we were looking at, 1666. What time are you talking about for this fort? We're talking about 1640, 1647, 48, I think, Tim. Oh. Um, it's, it, the, the interesting thing about what they found there, and I found this very reassuring if we think back to the 1634 fort that we were looking for, is that... It actually had rounded bastions at the corners, uh -huh. exactly what we, we thought we might find there. It had a ditch and bank with a, with a palisade. Um, basically, what they did, they, they dug a ditch, put some um, upright timbers in the ground, and then piled a bank against the ditch so you could stand uh, behind the tall high palisade and a big earthen bank at the front which would cut out uh, musket fire and give you an elevated firing position and so on. But the really interesting thing about that fort, which was only, what, five years after the fort we were looking for, is it had the ingredients of the fort that, that I was, was after, i.e. the rounded corners, the, the square shape, but with two bastions on one side and only one on the other. It was like a mid... Uh, a hybrid between being a, squ a square and having a triangular end, if that makes any sense. I could draw it easily. One of the other colonial forts was a triangle. That's right. Yeah, Jamestown had a, a triangular Jamestown. fort as well. Yeah. But this one at, Mar uh, at St Mary's was a hybrid between the two, almost if you, if you started drawing out a... Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. If you started drawing out a square like that, yeah. Instead of it coming back down and, and going like that, it's quite difficult doing a square on Zoom, isn't it? Um, it? It starts off as a square and then goes to a taper at one end. If it, a bit like a keyhole, but, but, but with re one regular side to it. And was there any connection between that um, period, that fort structure, 
and the area that Carenza was looking at and said she thought she could see some other features. She thought there might be gardens. Well, in, as, as, as the excavations there have demonstrated, there was, there was quite a lot of things around that house that we didn't really get to grips with at the time. We were only there for three days and, yeah. and put in small trenches in, but there were remains of other buildings that went with the mansion house. There were some paths and walls and yards and, and summer house type of thing. But there were also ditches, quite, quite well-defined ditches, uh, which were the ditches of the, of the forts, which at the time, uh, even if we'd found those, we probably wouldn't have, have, have uh, known quite what they were. And did the St Mary's City guys publish this um, fort excavation? Can people see it online or something? Yes, they can. In fact, um, if you go to hsmc org, Did they manage to find anything else on the St. Peter's site? Um, yes, they did. They, I mean, they found the, the, the exposed more of the layout of the building. You could see uh, internal rooms, some layouts of internal rooms, and they recognised that there were different phases within the building, much as you, you might expect as well as lots of artefacts. So there's, there's actually quite a lot of information on, on the website and also there is a plan showing all this and how the fort was laid out uh, around it. So the, the actual building was right in the centre of the fort, which actually was quite, quite small. There's another, um, another aspect of this that I was um, discussing with... Um, Derek and Lawrence recently, they're, they're, they're guys, they're called Career in Ruins. And I have discussions with them about their various archaeological thoughts and things. Um, I hadn't realized that the, um, a, a lot of that early work on the plantation was done by indentured labor. Um, many people from Britain and Ireland who went over there and in return for working for four years or more than four years mm. uh, for free, effectively, they would get a piece of land in return from that. Had you right. come across that before? I, I have indeed. And uh, it has echoes of the conversation we had the other week about the Nevis yeah. site, yeah. if you remember. Yeah. Uh, and, and the time in, in St Kitts and Nevis that I spent there because indentured slaves were used there a lot too. Uh, and, and it was quite common, particularly in the, the very earliest days of, of the colonial settlement. In fact, the, the African um, slaves really didn't start to make an impact uh, until um, 20, 30 years later than the first uh, colonial settlers arrived in Maryland. And initially, the indentured slaves were very much the, uh, the norm, I would say. And the, th the thing to remember about uh, the contract of indenture, which is what these people signed, is that for a lot of them, it was a pretty shabby deal. A lot of, people, a lot of them were, were promised that at the end of their five-year term, they, they get a bit of land and, or they get their passage paid back home. That didn't happen to about 50% of them. Uh, the contract of indenture allowed them to be sold on and quite often their terms were extended and they, because they weren't making any money, they weren't being paid, they couldn't buy themselves out of this contract and they were handed from one master to another. Um, it, it was a pretty awful life. Some were, were actually convicts which were offered the alternative of being hung or go, going out to, going out to the, the Caribbean or, or to the colonies. And so this, the whole aspect of indentured slavery is one that we've often uh, forgotten about. And this, I've got one personal memory I'd like to relay, if I might, Tim, um, from the time I spent in St. Kitts, yeah. because I spent a lot of time working amongst the sugar fields, mapping them and, and, and working amongst the, the local populations. And in one of the plantations that were still operating there, sugarcane, plantations that were still operating there, I came across this small shanty town settlement right on the, the far end near the coast. And it was a most eye-opening experience because living in these sheds were uh, 
people that were locally known as red legs. And they had the gait of African slaves, uh, African um, slave behavior, if you can put it that way. They walked along with pots on their heads and they, uh, they, they had all the bearing of what you'd imagine uh, enslaved Africans to have. But they were, they were effectively Caucasian, they were white, very often with dominant red features, almost like Celtic look about them. And they were still called the red legs because they were so burnt um, that they were, you know, they had the incredibly red legs. And, but what these, I found out through, from a, a lot of conversations, both with them and other people at the time, these were the direct descendants of what were white indentured slaves who had formed their own community on the island of St. Kitts and had continued to live there since the early 18th century, almost completely excluded from that kind of cultural development which happened when um, slavery ended and, and, and you know, we, we emerged in, into sort of modern day. They still retained all their lifestyle and their behavior of field slaves, but actually they, 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 were, they were white Caucasian in, in, their, you know, in their origins. Quite, quite extraordinary, I have to say. I think I read somewhere that in, uh, at the end of the 17th century, um, the African, um, who would become African-American, but the African slave population was about 10% of the St. Mary's city population. And then things changed because the price of tobacco went down and it meant that um, they weren't making the money they could make from it. And at the mm -hmm. same time, um, things improved in Britain. So there were less people coming out. And at that point, the African slave trade really um, uh, started becoming a plantation system. Maryland mm. became a plantation system. And I think the figures are that in about 1790 or so, by the end of the 18th century, there was something like 50 to 60,000 um, African slaves working in that area. Um, and the interesting thing is, recently, the um, St. Mary's College, um, have been, they were building, a, hoping to build a new stadium, and the college discovered some slave quarters with some objects from that period. And that, that's right. become an important part of the work they've been doing. And there's a very nice, um, we'll put it up on the website, a very nice, little explanation of the work they found and what they found. But what caught my eye was, I, I remember you talking about those small pieces of China ware cut into little squares. And they have found similar things on this site. All right. Um, but I think um, one of the professors at St. Mary's City, uh, I think they're in their an anthropology department, these little pieces of pottery, which you can see pictures of in this, in this uh, YouTube article um, that you can see, um, they'd broken off little bits that had sort of star effect um, things from Staffordshire, China, or from Chinese China, or wherever it had come from. Mm -hmm. And there was a link to um, a particular um, African a cult figure called Anansi, apparently. And he was, he was a sort of god of misrule and disturbance. <laughs> and um, the, the symbol of him was this strange little spidery image. And the, the people at St. Mary's, uh, you know, speculated that this was a, a deliberate cache. They talked about other caches with crystals, pins, little bits of pottery that the slaves were collecting together as a sort of um, form of ritual resistance in a way. Right. 
because it connected them. And I just wondered whether or not those pieces that you discovered in, in Nevis, and we talked about the tradition of that, mm -hmm. was an, another example of, of, of a similar cache of, of slaves trying to remind themselves. And you mentioned the, uh, is it the small red berries that they seem to have- The jumbly bead. Jumbly beads <laughs> that seem to have some um, significance. And it was fascinating. And I was only looking at this a couple of days ago um, on, on the St. Mary's site. And they're building this massive stadium and they found two or three areas of slave quarters. And you can see what they've found and see the work they're doing there. So it's still going on there. Um, and when you look at the aerial map, you can see where we were digging that point site there and see where St. Mary's um, College is. Um, and it's quite, it's quite a place. So it's amazing that there's still that material is still there and it's still it's getting, coming out. It's getting bigger and bigger, isn't it? I looked on Google Earth and, and, and I was quite surprised. Like, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's one thing that, I mean, the, those uh, items, you can imagine that if people are transported from, from Africa out to the Caribbean under horrendous conditions, so that the idea of keeping something alive, which is a memory of your previous culture, of your previous life, of your previous beliefs, you, you would hang on to things like that. They would, they would have special meaning to you in this, this completely new and alien world, wouldn't they? I mean, we, much like we might, we might hang on to a St. Christopher around the neck or something mm -hmm. like that. I think we tend to forget just how important just a, something very ordinary, like a little bead or a a broken piece of pottery that somehow has a sheen or a pattern on it that reminded you of something else, how important that might be. I think it's a really fascinating piece of history. That. It's quite, uh, quite, quite informative, that, Tim. Thank you. And I, I mean, the, the work they've done there, you can see it on the site um, and people can catch up with it. And they're clearly making it a part of the culture of the, the college there. Um, mm -hmm. it, what, what was odd as well, Stuart, was to reflect that we've, we had two experiences of colonial slave culture, if you like, in Nevis and then in St. Mary's City, although the period we were looking at in St. Mary's was the indentured um, it, part of it where the, there was a 10%, a, a I think, of African um, slaves were working there, but suddenly it expanded. And what was it all for? Essentially to produce cheap tobacco and sugar, which, mm -hmm. you know, from our modern perspective, you'd have to, they appear now like two rather useless or <laughs> unhealthy products. And yet literally thousands of people were dying every mm. year to, to produce this stuff, yeah. which is very, very strange. I think it's important to remember as well, though, that, Tim, as well as that, and, and the fact that they were making money for, you know, for lots of people at the time amongst that misery, but you've got to remember that going to the colonies in, in 1634, um, if you remember the, 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 the couple of hundred who went out to St Mary's, they were deliberately almost chosen as a mix of Catholics and Protestants. Mm. And there was very much a kind of religious fervour going on in the UK and, you know, and everybody was at each other's throats. And for a lot of people, going to the colonies offered a new life. Um, a bit like you know the, the, the Irish and the Scots in the, in the 18th and 19th, 19th century in particular. So for a lot of people, going to the colonies was a way of getting, getting away from the life they didn't want to lead in, in the UK at that time. So there were a, a number of mixed reasons of obviously the main was to make money, but there, there's obviously a lot of other more, more, deep, more deep reasons for, for moving out there. And I think I remember that I think the Calvert um, settlement there had a deliberate policy of tolerating both Protestants and Catholics because they'd had such a hard time of it in Britain. They wanted to create a kind of new society. 
Um, and, and when That's you right, look yeah. now in 2020, looking back to 1620 in the Mayflower, um, that original, those original settling impulses, which had that religious aspect to them. Have you been involved in any of those or, or been in touch with any of those other places that we regard as associated with, with the Mayflower? No, I haven't. It's not. It's it's the, the, the only work I've done in in the in the former colonies. I should say that now, shouldn't I? Yeah. Um, it was was in St Kitts and Nevis and and in Maryland. I've not had it. I've not done any work on any other the early colonial settlement sites. I'm afraid. Because the big um, the big sites are Colonial Williamsburg, um, and uh, Jamestown, Jamestown places mm. like that. Mm. Um, but it was odd that it, at St Mary's, you got that atmosphere of people having to hang on and then suddenly it becoming a massive business, um, effectively all based on, on slavery. And, mm. and that went on, I think it was, what was it, 1840, um, gradually legislation was passed but even mm. then a lot of the old plantation attitudes and and and, and methods carried on mm -hmm. um, mm. and i think it's uh, it's very it's very odd to think you know, when the when the first group landed there and calvert landed there they they occupied uh, a Chesapeake Indian village that already existed there. We, we tend to forget about the um, the pre-colonial settlements are there. There was an infrastructure, as an agricultural infrastructure, um, so based on largely on fishing, cropping, and so on. But there was an established communities. There were villages, and it's a story. It's replayed worldwide, isn't it? They, the, the, the settlers go out there in, initially. There's this period when they try to work with the local populations, yeah. and then tensions build up, and there's more desire. There's a desire for more land to make things more profitable, puts pressure on local populations, creates conflict, and and then we end up with you know with enforced settlement and and slavery and all its its worst geysers. Unfortunately, it's a pattern that repeated itself. Uh, around the world and it's it's not an it's not unknown in any aspect of archaeology is it when you think of the the roman the roman invasion in this you know before be, before caesar came we have that period of of trade and 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 collaboration and then and then gradually people live together work together the economies work together but there's tension there's always tension between uh, what in effect is is, is survival a mixture of survival and making money and ultimately the making money became the became the prime objective there and, and uh, that's the story of colonialism colonialism everywhere i'm afraid final thought um i remember looking some time ago at the original villages that the mayflower um the mayflower ship and the people who were on it um came from um, and quite a lot of people, I think, sort of basically assume they must be from the West Country because the boat finally left from Plymouth. Um, some people say it was Falmouth as well. But um, some of those original settlers were actually from the East Midlands and places like Nottinghamshire. Those people, um, due to religious intolerance, First of all, went over to Holland, I think, a large number of them, Leiden um, in Holland, and, and set up a society there where they could, there's more, there was more religious tolerance. And then one way and another, they would decided that America was the place. And the, mm -hmm. they acquired a couple of, one very leaky ship, and one not very good ship. And, and they sort of limped along the south coast of, of, of England before eventually making the crossing. <laughs> but uh, I often I often imagine that those original accents would have been sort of East Midlands, Nottinghamshire, South Yorkshire, some of those villages. Yeah. You know, there would have been a fantastic mixture of those original English accents going out there. It would. I think um, 
it's 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 a peculiar story in many ways. I don't you know what are we now? It was about 1997 when we went there, so we yeah. had chance to learn a lot more ourselves since we were out there. And strangely enough, when when you said we were going to have this conversation, um, I looked at bits of material about 25 minutes before we, you know, we, we were speaking. And you sort of think, I wish I'd seen this back in 1997 because I found something that was written by Leonard Calvert, who who settled there, which I never never were, saw at the time when we were there. I don't know if it was even given to us, and it relates back to the to the missing fork too. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a description which says, I'm quoting here. I'm, I'm quoting here from from the original document. It says, describes the fort that we were looking for, which we were never given a description of it when we were there. And it says, within a palisade of 120 yards square, which is the thing that you remember that, that I saw in the aerial photograph, with four flanks. So that was pretty much what we saw the shape on the aerial photograph that we were searching for for, for the first thought. It might have helped a little bit if we'd, if we'd seen that document then. So that, yeah, that, that's really quite nice, nice to know. And I think the fort that was found round St. Peter's, which was, you know, what, 10 years or so later, um, that had rounded bastions. So we, we know, I think, I'm very confident that what we were searching for the aerial photograph is, is the fort that was a square with round, rounded corners. And from the descriptions, it was also there only for t about 10 years, that fort. So it, it wouldn't have lasted very long. And the, you know, the evidence it left behind it probably was quite, you know, potentially quite ephemeral as well in the, the way the settlement expanded. So all hope of finding it is not yet lost. But I think the shape that we saw in that description matched together still, you know, I'm still fairly persistent on that one. I think after all these years, Stuart, you are demonstrating your usual persistence. Um, <laughs> I shall pass your thoughts on to Henry and right. see what he's got to say, because we're all 20 years older now, aren't we, really? We are indeed. <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, it'll be rather nice to, to find out his take on it. And... Um, work is still going on you know the st mary's college is still doing work the um the historic st mary's city um team are still developing their ideas about um a living um sort of museum and also the archaeology that's very current so it's still something that feels very lively and i my final memory really is that we were very lucky um, to have that trip on that boat. Um, there was something about, well, first of all, how relatively small it was. Um, and, and I think we were on the, the Ark or the Dove. I think it was the Dove, wasn't it? Um, anyway, we were on one of them. But that approaching the shore on that boat, which is still relatively unspoiled, and that it gave you that sense of the the feelings of those people um, when they were reaching that, that shore after God knows how long <laughs> at sea. Yeah. And, and, uh, landing on, on, in a place like that, it must have been a remarkable moment. And uh, it, it was nice of the St Mary's City people to share it with us, really. Stuart, thank you very much indeed. Lovely to talk again. And, um, and uh uh, we shall keep in touch and I'm still pursuing your ideas for your Time Team Fantasy site so hopefully we'll, we'll have a look at that soon. Okay, bye for now.